Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shan. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I will speak about uh, arterial pressure monitoring and how to use arterial pressure monitoring at the bedside. Uh, for this, I would like to, to give some words about uh, physiology of atoll pressure before uh, moving to the clinical use. So a few words about physiology. Uh, of course you know the physiology, just to, to remind you that atoll pressure is a complex result of ventricular ejection and elastic and resistive characteristics of the arterial tree. And the cardiac pump generates a pulsatile and not a constant flow. And the arteries are subjected to this pulsatility. And the arteries are tubes that distribute blood flow to organs. They are elastic structures that amortize the discontinuous cardiac ejection by storing, this is very important, storing a part of the stroke volume during systole and restituting during diastole. And this contributes to the, in part, to the arterial pressure waveform. During systole, there is no question, there is ejection of stroke volume, but during diastole, the part of the stroke volume which was stored in the wall of the aorta can be restituted during this time to the periphery. What are the determinants of aortic pressure? Stroke volume, of course, the degree of aortic rigidity, the greater the rigidity, the higher the pressure, and also the reflection waves phenomenon. Just a few words about the reflection waves. You know that the, the, you know that the arterial pressure waves, wave gets reflected every time it meets areas of change in impedance. It is a word to say simply bifurcation areas. This is like this. You have an incident wave and reflected wave for each bifurcation. Just imagine for a few seconds that aorta is a simple rigid tube with no reflection wave phenomenon. You should have this, this very, uh, I don't know if you see very well, an abrupt increase in pressure and that it during systole. But <clears throat> because of the reflection wave phenomenon, summing many reflected wave phenomena results in a reflected wave which elevates the aortic pressure with a maximum at the, at the beginning of the diastole. Maximum at the beginning of the diastole. And the reflected wave from the periphery is superimposed with the incident wave from the heart, and this generates the aortic pressure wave the final result. This is for normal people and young people. But if you have a reduction in the outer compliance or if you have a reflection site which is more proximal, meaning vasoconstriction if you want, the reflection wave returns faster to the Arctic level so that the reflected wave occurs earlier. And instead of occurring during the diastole, it occurs during the systole. And this results in this super, superimposition with a high systolic pressure. And there are three major consequences of this phenomenon, which is pathologic, of course. The first one is the increase in systolic aortic pressure with an increased risk of stroke. The second one is the increase in left ventricular afterload, which is represented here by this, the areas, the area with the arrows. This is the additional increase in afterload. 
And of course, it's not very good because you have an increased microdial oxygen demand in this situation. And also, you have a decrease in the diastolic aortic pressure and thus in the coronary perfusion pressure with a risk of microdial ischemia, of course. So this is not a, it's not a good situation to have this. And this because of this earlier reflection wave phenomenon. And of course, during the life, we move from a normal pattern to this uh, anormal pattern, and this also occurs with vasoconstriction, hypertension, and small, small A. But I, I told you that during the diastole, there is also another phenomenon, which is a restitution of the blood volume stored during systole, and this also contributes to the to increase the diastolic aortic, uh, aortic pressure in addition to the reflection wave phenomenon in young people. Again, you have this during the diastole, and this contributes to the diastolic part of the aortic pressure in addition to the reflection wave phenomenon. What about peripheral artery pressure now? Because I spoke about aortic pressure. In fact, we have an additional phenomenon uh, from the aortic level to the periphery. You have this kind of central pressure wave normally, but because of this other phenomenon, which is called the pulse wave amplification, you have this kind of pressure wave form at the periphery. And in general, we measure pressure, out, uh, outer pressure at the periphery, radial, brachial, or sometimes femoral, uh, but it is at the periphery, it's not at the level of the aorta. And for example, because femoral is closer to the aorta compared to radial, we should have a higher radial systolic aortal pressure and a higher radial pulse pressure compared to the femoral and uh, systolic pressure and pulse pressure. When you have a young man or woman, normotensive, vasodilated, and tall, you have this kind of uh, phenomenon with a large pulse wave amplification. But if you are old, hypertensive, vasoconstricted, and small, you have no big differences between systolic pressure at the periphery and systolic pressure at the level of the aorta because, and we say that we have no huge pulse wave amplification in this situation. Okay, now we can move on to the clinical use of atoll pressure. In fact, we can use atoll pressure uh, by two, two ways. We can pay attention to static values of atoll pressure, and they can provide useful information to assess hemodynamic status. In fact, we can pay attention to four values. Why four? Because they are very well identified. The systolic atoll pressure, the diastolic atoll pressure, the mean atoll pressure, and the pulse pressure, which is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure. And all these four values are very important because they can, be, they can be helpful for the interpretation of the hemodynamic status. The systolic atoll pressure is a reflection of the left ventricular afterload. And this is especially true in situations where there is a low pulse wave amplification. That is to say, in old patients, in patients with chronic hypertension, vasoconstricted for any vascular comorbidity, you could have a low pulse wave amplification phenomenon, and therefore, the systolic pressure you measure is a good reflection of the left ventricular afterload. In young people, in normal people, it's not true. Because the left ventricular afterload is better reflected by the 
systolic pressure at the level of the aorta, which could be different from the radial one, for example. So if you measure a systolic pressure of, I don't know, 140, this is a true afterload for an old patient. It's not for a young patient. Could be 120, for example. So this is a, the difference. The mean atoll pressure, of course, it is important, and you know that very well, because first, it is nearly constant along the arterial tree. There is no big differences between arterial, uh, peripheral, and central MAP. Of course, central is a little higher for blood flow, but not so uh, different. For example, a femoral MAP is equal to a radial MAP. And also, it is important because of this phenomenon, you know, this autoregulation of organ blood flow phenomenon. And you know that if you plot the organ blood flow on the y-axis and mean atoll pressure on the x-axis, you have this kind of relationship. And for the normal range of mean atoll pressure, you have a plateau. That is to say that there is no change in organ blood flow whatever the changes in MAP. This is good news, of course. Uh, just imagine that if you increase your MAP by, uh, I don't know, by, by making an exercise and your brain blood flow increases, could be terrible in terms of uh, headaches, etc. But this does not appear, uh, happen because of some uh, uh, ad adaptive uh, mechanisms. But, of course, uh, if you have a low MAP, uh, this is one of the definitions of shock. Uh, our job as intensivists is to try to push the value of, M of MAP uh, up to the plateau of this relationship to avoid any hypoperfusion only due to hypotension. But you know that in case of... Uh, chronic hypertension, you could have a shift of the autoregulation curve to the right. It was well demonstrated for the brain circulation, and you have a, this kind of shift. And therefore, value of MAP of 70, which could be on the plateau in patients with no prior hypertension, could be on the ascending part in patients with chronic hypertension. And this kind of patients, maybe you need a higher MAP to be on the plateau. And you have to increase a little the MAP using vasopressors, for example. And we try with uh, Pierre Asfar and others uh, to compare two ranges of MAP as targets uh, for resuscitation of septic shock. And we uh, randomized two uh, subgroups of patients, one which was managed according to the target, these targets with the targets we tried to, we tried to reach, 65, 70, another one, a higher target, 80, 85. As you know, there was no difference in mortality. We found a signal. We found benefits in terms of kidney function with a high MAP, which is not very high, but the higher level of MAP target in patients with a history of chronic hypertension. So it can make sense to try to increase a little MAP in case of chronic hypertension if uh, the patient is still in shock, for example. What about the diastolic atoll pressure? This is also a very informative value because DAP is a good reflection of vasomotor tone and, for example, a low, MA, a low DAP is mainly due to depressed atoll tone. So if you look at the atoll pressure curve and you observe a low DAP, this suggests a decreased atoll tone. This suggests a septic origin of shock. In general, it could be anaphylactic, of course, but in general, septic origin of shock. And this inside to administer vasopressor, and sometimes urgently. Just a quiz for you. Now you have, to, you have to work. 
Just imagine two patients, patient A and patient B. Uh, patient A arriving at the same time at the emergency department, for example. Patient A with heart rate of 140 and atoll pressure of 9040, and patient B, heart rate of 70 and the same atoll pressure, 9040. What do you think about the atoll tone in these two patients? Equally depressed in A and B, more depressed in A, more depressed in B, or normal in both cases? Who, who votes for number one? Equally depressed. For number two, more depressed in A. For number three, more depressed in B. Three, four, five, six, seven, and normal in both cases. Nobody. The good answer is number two. <laughs> Why? Because just imagine tachycardia. This is two heartbeats and two atoll pressure curves, uh, consecutive uh, pressure curves with a DAP. Imagine tachycardia. In this situation, there is no time for the diastolic pressure to decline completely. And you should have a higher DAP by definition. So in the example I gave you, the DAP was the same, meaning that probably in the patient with tachycardia, the acetone was totally depressed. Otherwise, the DAP should be higher. So pay attention to DAP, but also pay attention to heart rate at the same time for, the, for a good interpretation. But DAP also can be low in case of bradycardia, as I said, but also in case of outer stiffness, and this is the other factors. DAP is important also because this is a driving pressure for left ventricular coronary perfusion. This is also why it is important to correct diastolic pressure to avoid uh, macular ischemia. Because as you know, this is a coronary blood flow of the left coronary vessel and right coronary vessel. As you can observe, for the left coronary vessel, it is essentially during the diastole. Why? For the right ventricle, blood flow is, uh, occurs in the systole as well as in the diastole. Pulse pressure now, briefly, at the level of the aorta. The aortic pulse pressure is proportional to stroke volume and also to aortic stiffness. But because stiffness is very important, just imagine an aortic, uh, 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 stiff aorta in case of uh, old patients, hypertensive patients, diabetic patients, etc. You should have a larger pulse pressure for the same stroke volume, for normal stroke volume. Therefore, if you observe a low pulse pressure in this situation, for example, 30, 40, you know that the patient has a low stroke volume. He should have a higher pulse pressure normally. So all these values are very important, can be helpful to, to assess the hemodynamic status. And of course, also you can use the dynamic change in atoll pressure because it can provide uh, useful information to assess per responsiveness. I don't want to go into details because my first presentation this morning was dedicated to pulse responsiveness. So just to remind you that if you have a high pulse pressure in general, this is associated with pulse responsiveness and a low pulse pressure with pulse unresponsiveness. And this was proven, proven in many studies, this one and others. And this is a meta-analysis showing that it is good to predict free responsiveness in patients with mechanical ventilation. And also, you can use it to assess changes in cardiac output, not only to predict, but also to assess the changes. This is a picture with a high PPV, 32%, and you give fluid, and PPV went down to 5%. You can imagine that cardiac output increased. And you can, maybe you can replace cardiac output monitor just by looking at the changes in 
PPV, and this is what, would, what was done by this study by Le Malnac and co-workers, published in anesthesiology years ago, and they observed a nice correlation between the changes in PPV after fluid administration and the changes in calic output. So if you have no calic output monitor and the patient is mechanically ventilated with a normal tidal volume, you can rely on the changes in PPV to assess the changes in calic output after fluid administration. And we have many devices now able to look at PPV and you know all the limitations. I don't want to go into details. Just to finish, I emphasize on the importance of atoll pressure monitoring at the bedside and essentially in shock patients. And this paper, which is an expert panel uh, paper and with many of the speakers uh, of today, Jean-Louis Vincent, Daniel De Backer, and others, we propose to insert atoll catheter in every patient with shock. And it is very useful to measure atoll pressure and all the values we uh, discussed, but also PPV, and also to, 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 to sample blood to measure PA, CO2, PAO2, etc. So my conclusion is that please use atoll pressure monitoring and use all the pieces of information that you can, you can obtain. Thank you very much.